2nd of March 1991. This is Janice Unwin interviewing John Torrance, Columpha Farm, Port Logan, on behalf of Kirkmaiden Information Centre in connection with the Oral History Project. Good evening, John. Good evening. Thank you for agreeing to speak to me. Would you like to tell me when you first came to your house at Columpha and under what circumstances? Well, Janice, it was about 1942, uh, November, I believe, and in those days, uh, farmers like farm workers moved twice a year. In other words, it was a November term or a May term. And I always remember we came here in the November term because it was blowing a ruddy gale. And in those days, there wasn't a tree about the farmhouse at Columpha apart from on the east side. And that day we came here, we only moved actually from Arbwell because we had been in Arbwell house, uh, house in the steading, which is the, now the farmhouse. We'd been there for a year between farms. And that day, as I say, it was blowing a hurricane and mother had a piano which the family tried to play on, but we really abused it. And the poor old thing was nearly blown off the farm trailer <laughs> because father used the trailers to move us from Arbor to Columpha. And I'll never forget that day. Um, and father there and then decided he would plant trees, which he duly did about okay. five, five years later. Very good decision. And and put in Sitka, mm -hmm. but uh, they haven't just quite weathered the storm as well as some of the other varieties should have done. That was in '42, and to put you in the picture, in those days, um, when we came here, um, father decided not to continue the tradition of making cheese. Because up until then, nearly all the farms had made cheese, and Columpha was still making cheese when we came. But he decided then, in his wisdom, that he would stop cheese making and try and bring in the TT accredited testing to the cows. In other words, to guarantee that the cows were free of TB. And to produce a TB free milk, for which he would obviously get a premium. So for a couple of years we had reduced stock. We came with only 40 cows, which had been more or less past the test as it was termed in those days. So for the next two to three years he built it up. But they were not wasted year because the first the first year we retained the cows the little farm we had at um, near Stranra and we got it the old buyer with local labour. We had two excellent masons who came and stayed with the family in the house here. And they laboured continuously for nearly a whole year. And they, they used the local sand and gravel. And uh, lots of hard work because it was shovels we used. No pre-mix or ready mix in those days. So the only thing we brought in was cement from McCormick's at Stundra. And uh, the buyers, as I say, were got it all cement rendered and cement stalls put in because I can well remember the old buyer had a loft over most of it. And that was an extension to the cheese loft. You see, the dairy was at the end of the buyer. And the... Uh, the the dairy was at the end of the by a two-storey building with a proper cheese loft above it with heating pipes, believe it or not. So to give extra storage during the winter to let the cheese cure and develop, they roofed, of no, not roofed, floored over most of the buyer. And that meant that the, the floor was supported with supports from the stalls so it was a maze of wooden divisions for the cows with supports. So that was all wiped out, as I say, and replaced with concrete impervious, you know, smooth concrete divisions for the cows to be tied to the neck. 
and ventilators punched in the stone walls, which was a hell of a job, because every cow had to have fresh air. Mm -hmm. That was the, the, the theory. Am I right in assuming that the cheese loft was above the bay for because of the heat? Was the heat something to do with it? Rising mm, from the beasts, or was that um, just... To a degree that would be true, but by the time they were there, they were in the later stages of the curing. Mm. You see, in the first stages when they were made, they were put into the proper cheese loft, where they were put on, on um, racks, but these racks at Columfa were the more modern type because they could turn them. So the cheese, you see, had to be turned by hand once a week, I believe. And in those ones, they were on swivels, and you had three shelves that turned to avoid this manual business of turning the swivel from top, no, 90 degrees, mm -hmm. 180 degrees, sorry, they turned. So you didn't need to lift the cheese and turn it manually, you just turned it the unit of three shelves and that was right to be well it was modern and, and faster and from there they were carried through into the buyer section where they were left sitting more or less for weeks until they were sent off. The cheese inspector came and he took a sample pail out you know a little yeah. tool mm -hmm. tested them and if they got the certificate of grade one well, of course, it was it was fine, and they were sent off to the city, you know, where the cheese factors, yes. they came and took them away. But that was really what we did for that year, it was gutting out and redoing the buyer, and uh, we'd, we'd knock down the, some of the pig houses and put in another buyer for more cows, because when we came here, we had 122 cows, and um, with the other, we built another buyer parallel to the old one, and that gave us 150 cows. Um, although we did retain part of the, the piggery, and for two or three years afterwards, I had breeding sows and fattened their progeny. But that was a very small effort compared to the hundreds of pigs I had at one time uh, before we arrived, because. You see, the cheese was made all summer, and the byproduct was whey, and that whey was fed to the fattening pigs, and they simply uh, bought in uh, maize, corn, and supplemented whey with their own oats and so on. Did a whole mix, and boiled the maize up and added bean meal and this sort of thing. It was quite simple but quite effective. Mm -hmm. So they also had the byproduct of pigs, you know, fat pigs from the farm. And and that was typical of the rins. And a lot of those pigs were actually killed on the farm and and uh, slaughtered on the farm and then taken away as a carcass to the town curer. Um, that really was the set up then. We actually had uh, six cottages and a dairy house and when father came he streamlined the staff but he still had about eight men working and a dairyman and when we were in full flight with a hundred and fifty cows tied by the neck and all the dung to barrow away from them and turnips to bring in and uh, straw or hay that was the basic feat because they really were housed in the winter in kind of storage condition you see there wasn't much milk then it, it, they were dry, in other words, the cows were not producing milk in the winter, they were tied in there for protection. So they had a very simple diet. Then when they started to calve in the spring, of course, then they started to get f extra feeding in the way of home-produced mix and or cake, which was bought in, you know, compound cake with vitamins mm -hmm. and so on, for the milk production. And we tried to uh, get them carving prior to going to grass because obviously that was the cheapest way to produce milk. And, and then there was an incentive given for winter milk, so we gradually changed and had them carving earlier. That then meant we couldn't uh, only feed them turnip and straw, we had to feed them turnip and hay. And of course a natural de development was in later years when the milk board wanted even more winter milk, 
they were carving instead of carving in, in, in February or January they started to carve in the autumn so that meant we could try and provide a better winter feed so silage came along and that allowed the production of true winter milk um, in those days the dairymen had a had a long hour long hours of work not quite as bad market as uh, when they made cheese I'll just tell you a wee brief story um, at Columpha here apparently before we came they used to have a harvest home in the granary and it wasn't a very wide granary but it was a long granary and here they were having a great set to this particular hot and night after the harvest was in with the, and they'd taken the lamps out of the byre to light the granary for the festivity and about three, between three and four in the morning they were still at it when the dairyman Johnny Moreland was the dairyman at Columpha and he came thumping up the stone steps knocked and barked and burst the door open and said if you bloody folk any, any sense when they can him I can when they had to start and he just there and then lifted the buyer lamps and left them in the dark <laughs> so that was the end of the can. <laughs> Oh, with a bit of luck, it might have been daylight. <laughs> it was dark near, I believe. I only, um, as I say, that typified the hard work the dairyman did yes. because he was starting. Mm -hmm. uh, when when we the dairyman here, he had a family of three boys, and that meant there were four of them working in the dairy, mm -hmm. uh, and that was only producing milk. But admittedly, they helped to bring in the turnips from the field. You see, in the winter. Uh, and, and, and also fed the, the cows with the turnips. But you, you see, in, in those days at Columpha here, they grew about 50 or 60 acres of turnips or sweds. A few mangles, not, not a lot, they were fed in the spring. And it meant that a lot of folk were dependent on squads. But with us having these three lads, they did a lot of the turnip showing in the field as was required and being in a, a relatively frost free area we never um, topped and tailed, carted and pitted, we only yeah. topped, tailed and carted to requirement in yes. other words, just to yes. keep them fresh, mm -hmm. well not daily but at least pretty often every other day they were t t hauling turnips in from the field to feed to the cows so that was a steady winter work that and getting rid of the dung. Um, um, but I think that really it, it, it was long arduous hours at the job and as I say even with these eight men we still had recourse to squads and if I may diverse from that to give you an instance of what the squads did I mean it was a round a year job the, the, the squads were sometimes locally uh, gathered up with a gang master uh, from the local village and they went round the farms in rotation helping out at big operations and you see here we started to grow out the potatoes although they had been undone before but our neighbour did them and a lot of farmers in the, in the rinds did out the potato growing. We came in as one of the last people to do it. Um, father had no opportunity to do it, the previous farmer, when he came here he was smitten with the bug as it were and joined the locals so we had to a squad to help to plant the tatties and then they were used to lift the stones whiles in the spring to get the grain in if it was a late spring you maybe hadn't enough of your own people to do it in a hurry so the squad was brought in for two or three days and then from then they would go on and thin turnips if the, the folks weren't able to get on fast enough, if it was a growthy spring, the turnips got dirty and they got big, so you had to get help in to get them done before they got too big. Then from there they would progress to digging the early tatties or assisting. Sometimes the local squad dug the tatties and whilst you would get an Irish squad depending on which merchant you were working with, for pretty often the tatty merchant, be it from Glasgow or Cooper or wherever, he would provide a squad and therefore that's how the Irish squads came in because 
he would go to Ireland and engage a squad and it would start digging tatties maybe at the end of May, beginning of June. They would dig in Wigtonshire and then into Ayrshire and move north uh, and east and they would finish digging the main crops in Fife and the Lothians mm -hmm. and might not get home until to Ireland, back to Ireland until about August, September. So they had quite a few months in Scotland digging tatties all the time, you know. So they, they were supp supple off the back and whiles quick at the temper, especially they had a drama in them. And from the early tatty digging, you see, you then moved on to the harvesting scene. And pretty often, if it was a rotten harvest, uh, wet weather and stooks had to be turned, then the squad was brought in to get the fields cleared. And if you had a small stuff, you had no option but get one or two. And you see, that was another thing. At Columfa, before we came, apparently they always had two or three Irishmen came and they stayed in the farmhouse. And there was a separate staircase, I can remember, at Columfa, out of our kitchen here. And that was the bothy uh, thingy upstairs. Mm -hmm. And that held the three Irishmen for the harvest. So it must have been a steady event, you know, for five weeks probably. With this yes. was prolonged yes. at times mm -hmm. with the weather. Mm -hmm. I'd nearly forgotten about that. Um, the staircase no longer. Is it went up there. Oh, I see, yeah. uh, in there but it's you know since gone it was mm -hmm. altered. And then from the harvesting went to the turnip harvest and that was where there was sometimes help there. And then of course in smaller farms when they were thrashing off the, the cereals in the winter, either to feed the beasts or if they were lucky to sell the, the seed for the grain, sorry, for seed purposes, um, they would need help there at the big mill because some farms had a mill built into the steading, but most depended on a contractor coming with the big mobile thrashing mill. And when it arrived, it was a great event on the farm. It might only be there for one day, it might be there for a week, depending on the size of the farm and the weather again, mm -hmm. because it was all obviously outside. So that um, it needed a big number of folk to make it run efficiently. I was thinking the last day it would take about eight people full time when it was really? there, at least. Because in l later days, you see, not only did it thrash the grain, but the farm bales of straw, mm -hmm. and then the grain had to be had to be carted away from the mill and stowed either in the steading or maybe put onto a lorry or carts to take a, a sole straight from the mill. It used to be a great feat. The grain match would follow the mill round the country, and he would come in and look at. The, I can see him yet looking at the grain as it was coming out the wee shoots at the back. And you had, it was graded, you had uh, two shoots for the top quality grain, and then you had a third shoot for smaller piled grain, and then there was another one, and it was more kind of rubbishy stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the chaff fell out the bottom of the mill onto the ground, and as a youngster, that was my job, cutting this bloody chaff away. What did you do with it? Well, if it was good quality, believe it or not, it was sometimes lifted in a sheet and put in amongst the straw. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't good, it was carted away and burned there and then. If there were a lot of weeds in it, it was burned on the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, removed from the steading, obviously, and yeah. that, was the, that was the youngster's job. And of course, if you had to cart it away 20 or 30 yards to be on the proper side of the wind, it could be quite tiring, you know, mm -hmm. hauling this away. But I can remember, you know, when they had really good uh, chaff, and it was oats in those days, there was no wheat or no, no barley, oh my God, it was all oats. And the best chaff was carefully selected, and a lot of farm workers made the bed, the mattress, and maybe even a pillow with it, and, and that formed the pillow, and of course it was laying with the... Uh, the appropriate cloth, what is it you call it? Like a tick. Like a, a tick. ticking, yeah. Ah, that's it. Mm. And, and it was changed every year. They, they, they threw out the old chaff and put in fresh, fluffy chaff for the winter. 
That was the, the, the best stuff. I mean, it was only done in a small scale. Mm -hmm. It had to be the tops. If it wasn't good, it wasn't used, of course. It was just burned or used for bedding cattle, you know. But the great fear there was if it was retained, you see, in the weed seeds. Yeah. And that only, that only extended the, the, the weed problem. The weed problem. Another time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's interesting. Well, you've given me quite a lot of detail there, John, about your early memories of Columfa. Can you tell me now some more personal aspects? I understand you were very keen on the young farmers at one time. Um, well, you see, I was in, I was, um, let me see, 12, 14 when I came, uh, 12 fully when I came here. So all I could think about in those days was getting to the bloody school. And that meant going to the Stellar High. And um, in those days, um, the bus did not come through Columfa or, or Port Logan. It went up the main road, as it, you know, the main Dromoa road to Artwell. Now, in those days of the war, there were a lot of evacuees in the village. Plus, of course, there were youngsters from Port Logan village. And there was a gang of about 10 or 12, and they all either had to walk from Port Logan to the toll, mm. you know where the toll is, mm -hmm. where there used to be a house yeah. there, mm -hmm. with a, a lovely shaped gable to yeah. catch the toll in the old days, where it's since gone, as you're well aware. Well, they either had to walk or cycle, and I didn't go via Port Logan, I went to the trolley side. And I can remember my father putting the, the position to me, I would get a bike if I was prepared to cycle, not to trolley, but further up the road towards Belgowan, because at the Marrick Road, that was the, one of, of the different stations where the rate, the charge rate on the bus changed. Right. If I went there, it saved him 10 quid a year. <laughs> and the bike cost him a fiver. <laughs> I thought he was still gaining. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. So I cycled to my road and left the bike there yeah, morning and night, yeah. You couldn't do that now? No, well, this is, that was the way in those days you had to pay for the bus mm -hmm. so much. Yes. You know, it was subsidised, but you still had to pay. Mm -hmm. So we, I cycled there. And the nose, and the unfortunate thing was there must have been a tremendous gale, I think about 40, 41, because the old Logan Avenue, of which we have parked in the farm, was absolutely blocked with trees. And of course there were no chainsaws, so it took father and the men the best part of two years, for they only did it when they took the notion, mm -hmm. you know, and had spare time. Mm -hmm. But they, they did try and set too, because it was quite a handy road to move stock, but you, not you much. You could go from the Bright Cottage to Myrick Road, That's it. via the avenue, and that's eventually it. you could have gone down as far as... The Port Logan Road. Come Aye, on. that's it, to Mrs. Wool, what we term old Mrs. McRae's. Yes, the ruin at the end. The old there, ruin. Yeah. I think she was the last, must have been the last mm. occupant yes. in that house for the still referred to as Mrs. McRae. And of course, they went by the, where the keeper was, uh, yes. Bradshaw, yes, that on the Marrick section. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is still a presentable house today. Yes. So, I could, as I say, I couldn't use that avenue because it was blocked with trees. But then thereafter, it was so rutted with the farm tractors and, and carts that I always used the main road. It was longer, but at least you could cycle on it. No bother. But, um, oh, we, we used to have set twos. One day, I remember going into school in the bus. It was a single decker only in those days, and there was a sharp glass carab. And he was a, a Dromore uh, McGuffey, and he'd been in Glasgow in his youth. And one of his favourite tricks was freewheeling. I mean, it's highly legal, but in those days, that was a height of, of professionalism if you could freewheel anything, save petrol or something. <laughs> and we're freewheeling down the hills into Stenrar, and there's a wee farm right on the edge of the town, where near Murray is today. Yeah. Just near it, not yeah. far off it. And here, Lord, the daring and released, I had the cows in front of us. And I, I was amongst those that were getting wanting out early that morning. The next bloody man, he was doing the match, he said, stop. And there's about 12 of us got belted into the back of his 
cabin nearly broke the glass beside them uh-huh. in this emergency stop where Glasgow Rob doing his free wheeling. He could actually free wheel right into the school. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, as, as I said earlier, the, the Young Farmers really was quite a, an interesting outlet for country lands like us because we had um, great friendships built there. We had uh, socialising, we had competitions, we even had speech making and it was the most dreaded of the lot. Um, and in that period we had the break up of the local club into two sections. Originally it was Stranra on the Rhin side and Marcus on the other side of the water. But um, our neighbours, the Macleans, were instrumental in forming a Southern Rhin's club which meant we had two in this area because in those days we had a lot of young farmers um, and um, of course today things have changed and there is no not the population of farmers nor big families. There's still so the two groups then? There are still two groups but the struggle whereas in those days you know one club was too big mm-hmm. you either were in the top nucleus or you got nowhere and that was the reason they started and broke it up Mm. because it was too big and too unwieldy Mm. so they they justified two clubs. Um, But the the great event then was the annual dance and the annual root show. The root show was always for one reason or another held in Newton Stewart but it was an inter sort of Wittenshire thing. Mm-hmm. And there was great rivalry to, to try and compete in it. Um, and what forms did the competitions take? What sort of classes were there? Well, it, you mean at the root show? At the root show, yes. Ah, at the root show, well, there were the basic things for the boys was um, hay samples, straw samples, you know. They had turnips quality in the heaviest and, and uh, mangles. Um, they had grain samples and they were very highly contested, you know, oats and barley and wheat. Latterly, of course, silage became the thing and it was always, I mean, we've always had a very strict instruction that the silage was to be retained in polythene bags and no, oca- no occasion whatsoever whether to be opened because on one or two occasions they used to put it down behind the radiators and the place suddenly become absolutely stunk out. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course uh, the girls, they had um, their competitions really on the lines of the rural, <coughs> to be honest with you. There'd be a copy of the rural, I would say. Yeah. But in their uh, age range rather than, you know, my base profession, as the as the rural, which was you know much more advanced and professional, mm-hmm. but there again, a lot of the girls were pretty natty, you know. Mm-hmm. And you also mentioned the annual dance. That obviously was something to look forward to. Where was that held? Well, um, it was, and you know, and I think that today we maybe lose something because everybody dressed up the very best. A real ball. A real ball. Quite honestly, it was. They, they had, of course, let's face it, we had jigs during the summer. Any time was an excuse for a, 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 a wee co- a country dance. But at the Christmas period, there was a real ball. I and. Uh, uh, so that would be real evening, was, evening dress for yes, the Yes, aye, of kilts for those okay. that were Very nice. that way inclined. And funny enough, it was held in the old King's Arms. Which and where was the old King's Arms hotel? Well, <coughs> the old King's Arms was in Stenra on Castle Street, at the bottom end where the modern Woolworths building is. Oh. And it was an immense, to my eyes in those days, it really wouldn't, but I, I, we thought it was an immense hotel, in size that is, and um, it was used by everybody, because although it was a big hotel, we hadn't got five star or four or three star ratings in those days. Um, it had a good public bar, but of course, 
when we went there it was for the annual ball, that was the main thing, and it was quite a dressy affair for us youngsters, um, you know, with formal dress for that occasion. The boys uh, either had a, a very good lounge suit or some even had dicky bows and kilts. And of course the girls tended to all have long dresses in those days. None of your miniskirts were that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> even, even they never appeared at the village hops, much to their dismay. <laughs> <laughs> and what form would the music be on this? Well, um, it was generally a local band. There were very rarely did we get external bands, and there certainly were no um, money available in our organisation, Young Farmers, to pay for such a thing. So they were really all local musicians with the usual drum, fiddles and piano. There were accordions, of course. Hi, well, the other favourite place for the, this big night out was for Patrick Hotel. That's what, that's the old one in the Hyok Head, which is sometimes called the Hydro. It was built by the family from Dunsky, or Ewings built it. I think that would be the turn of the century they would build it. But then in those days, you see, Perpatrick enjoyed a railway line, mm -hmm. and therefore it gave it a bit of upmanship. So it was quite a do to have a do, as it were, at the Perpatrick Hotel. Normally the other wee hops we had in the course of the year were down in the hall, I, 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 but in Port Patrick Hall oh, in Port Patrick was Patrick. a very regular Saturday night meeting place for all and sundry. And although the, the, the forward and the older lads and lasses went, there were not many girls, but the boys certainly after the rugby went to the pub, the pubs I should say, in Port Patrick, and then adjourned to the Port Patrick Hall. Those of us who went direct to the hall without venturing or being brave enough to go to the pubs, we were given nothing but, um, well, you weren't given, you bought uh, crispies and soft drinks, no alcohol whatsoever in the hall, uh, to try and keep the jollifications within bounds. But carrying on from that, you see each village hall in turn would have a jig or a dance or a big party. Pretty often there will be one on every weekend in rotations, such as the King's Hall in Tremor, the Port Logan Hall, Kirkham, Glenluce. Mm. Those were the ones in the rings. Occasionally it's Sandhead, but not much. I'd like to know something about King's Hall in Tremor. Aye, well, you, never... you see, it got mm. a new lease of life with Robert College, who was very much on the go then, he was involved with the Model Hall Fund when they produced a hall or built a hall at Mull and is there mm -hmm. today for the rural and the local mm -hmm. activities. And it's sad when you look back and consider that they ever built a special hall after the war at the Mull. It shows the population change mm -hmm. because it was. However, to, to return to the moor itself, the, the main hall there was, uh, I reckon, the King's Hall. And um, it was used very regularly, as I say, as a place of social enjoyment uh, in a very wide sense of the word, because it had the evening dances on a regular basis with, you know, visiting bands coming in. And then it latterly was used for the cinema and Robert College had weekly cinema shows in the hall and of course it saved the travelling in and out to Stranraer, saved time and money and he had a good range of films for quite a number of years um, until of course the modern 3D effect hit the regal and the cinema and he couldn't compete you know with the improved screens that the big cinemas had. But it had a beautiful strong floor which was marvellous for dancing, you know, really great. Um, and and, and it, was, it was really marvellous how the hawks went in these halls. As a special treat 
during the year we would get the likes of Jimmy Shan coming down and Ian Powery and a lot of the crack um, Scottish country dances, they had a circuit mm -hmm. and we would get them maybe once or twice a year and they would do a tour around Scotland and they would come down into this remote area like the rest and of course it was always a pack out and a hell of a job to get tickets. But it was a marvellous night, you know, with that. Obviously, country dancing was very popular in this. Yeah, country. it and, and the other laugh, of course, was locally uh, when Port Logan School was open. Um, the schoolmaster there decided he would form a youth club, and it was a, it was a great idea because I was still at high school, and it was great to get down to the village hall, and he taught us various things including uh, making bedside lamps. I had one for years until it got broken and um, I can't remember how, but it was made in plastic. And we cut this thing out with, you know, hacksaws and <laughs> hacked away. But it was amazing what we turned out in the course of the winter. And then he decided we'd better be educated with our feet. And they had ballroom dancing and uh, it was quite hilarious at times. But it, it was amazing you know, what we derive from it, because it gave you great confidence to be able to try and do, um, well, slow waltzes, and the quick step was my favourite by far, and I owe that to him alone, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and all the local young people went, I mean, it oh, wasn't, yes. wasn't just some, it was no. everybody. It was open to anybody, and, and he had a great way, well, obviously being a schoolmaster, he had a way with youngsters. But this was all free and for now in his own time. I can't remember what we paid, if anything. If we did pay, it was sweeties, you know, literally very, very little. It might be for the, for the lighting. Mm -hmm. I think that would be mm -hmm. all would be charged in the hall. So the hall was used even then for community work. You know, one tends to think today, oh, community is somewhat new, but it really isn't. Yeah. Uh, the spirit was even there, and of course, um, people would never have dreamt of going away to air to listen to a pop concert or that. You know, you heard them on the radio and that was it. You were, that was all you could get, unless there were the odd occasion to Glasgow and, you know, a bus would run up and tickets would be provided before you left so you could actually be sure of a seat. But these were very rare. Um, going back to the young farmers for a minute, um, we mentioned about the competition at the annual root shows and what have you. The other thing I think I mentioned briefly was in the speech making and it was the thing that was worst attended and the only way they used to trap us into it was to have surprise nights and you didn't know what the topic would be but gradually you discovered if it was a surprise night it was a bloody speech making. <laughs> <laughs> or it was held at the AGM and there was always a better competition to be in committee. So you were, if you were ambitious at all, you were trapped there. But in fairness, it was a good training ground because when we had our annual um, gathering of young farmers, it could be at Oban or Perth or Glasgow or Edinburgh, it always toured around the country as it does today. It gave you great confidence to be able to partake in even the smallest way at a conference and of course it eventually led to those that wished to go into NFU uh, that's the only sort of politics that was available a few farmers have become MPs not many but a few and have, have acquitted themselves pretty well and it's largely through <coughs> the young farmers and then the NFU that they've been able to do this a progression in other words what the NFU does at local level is really carried through with representatives going to Edinburgh um, on a regular basis to represent the views of the local members on various aspects of the day, whether it's BSE or the levy on grain or the position of potato quotas or the ideas on milk quota such like political hot potatoes are debated at Edinburgh. 
and the real work is done in what's termed commodity committees, in other words, a committee dealing solely with potatoes, one with cereals, uh, one with livestock, etc. And then three or four times in the year they have a general council where everybody that is uh, going to the hierarchy attend Edinburgh and normally there are about 100 members in that office uh, holding capacity at Edinburgh for a general debate uh, and thrust and parry on the different viewpoints and what the national policy will be on various topics. In the old days you see it was a case of going to Westminster and meeting with the English colleagues and then meeting with the, with the Ministry of Agriculture. The Scottish lot always went down to join the English and Welsh counterparts to meet with the Ministry of Agriculture because there was determined the rate of subsidy that we would get for that period. And believe you me, after the war there was a lot of subsidy because the whole emphasis was more and more and more food. That was the prime aim. It wasn't a case of environment or anything else. It was unheard of. It was just to get more and more and more food. And therefore, to encourage this, um, there were subsidies. And there were subsidies not only to produce food, but subsidies to improve buildings, to get more livestock in buildings. Because during the war, there had been virtually no building done whatsoever. Everything was under uh, licensing. And of course, the only people that got licenses were for emergencies, hospitals and roads dealing with the military. If it was civilian, unless it was a fire or such like uh, bombing, you didn't get a building license. So this was to speed up the depredation of about seven years of war conditions. But falling on from that, um, the arguments at Westminster may, maybe were heated in those days because nobody ever gets their own way and they never ever get enough. But today the argument is to be taken to Brussels and that's why in Scotland we are proud of the fact that we have a voice directly into Brussels. Right through to the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, where the Scottish voice is heard independent of the English voice. Generally they are in accord, but the special conditions of Scotland are spoken out separately. So much so even this last year we have had special grants for the Highlands and Islands and part of Galloway is included in this special Group 4, whereby we have special um, monies available for the rural area, not necessarily farming, but it's the rural benefit, whether you're starting a small business or not, that is the main aim, is to try and improve the rural background. Mm. So we're very proud of that through the works there. So much so that an Englishman, Lord Plum, became the first UK president of the European Parliament and he was entirely an NFU rep and he was the first Englishman to be president of the European Parliament which is no small feat. Anyhow, I've maybe done enough bombing in that respect. What else would you like to know? <laughs> right, um, maybe we could just uh, talk a little more then about Port Logan itself and um, you said you, because you were at school in Stranraer it meant it was a good excuse to mix with the local people when you had dances and so on. And what other activities went on in Port Logan? In Port Logan Hall? Well, <coughs> the hall was really the home of the Rural Institute. And they would be the most regular users, from what I recollect. And I can well remember the Rural Party was always a highlight. Um, especially the one near the, the back end of the year you know, the near Christmas period, and there was always plenty to eat, and plenty to laugh about, and they always had a, it was a fun night. There was dancing, and there was singing, and uh, one of the local worthies, Percy Carpenter, 
who stayed at Mull Hill for many, many years and worked to the late James McIntyre at Logan Mains. Percy was a, a natural singer and I can still remember him if ever there was a lull in the party and there was need of entertainment. Percy would be so easily coaxed onto the platform to sing Bonnie Strathair. <coughs> and then we had <coughs> the likes of <coughs> others like Lily McGuffert who could stand up and recite no bother at all on various topics, whether it was Burns or whether it was a Cuthie Scotch poem. Lily had no qualms whatsoever, um, much to everybody's amazement. Um, Even into her latter years, she could still she do that. Could, yes. Mm -hmm. It was something that uh, was inherent in the woman. It must have been. It must have been. Going back to Port Logan again, <coughs> I can remember in the early days <coughs> her brother, <coughs> or me, Tommy uh, McConnell, used to put the cows down the roadsides. He only had about 10 or 12 cows in those days. Where but did he come from? <coughs> at Mildaddy, oh, up at Mildaddy. Yes. But in those days, you see, there was no intensification and his herd was about half memory. It wouldn't be 20. I'm sure in the early days when we came it was about 12 cows. Anyhow, the point was, Tommy to extend his farm, put them down the roadsides to graze the grass in and around Port Logan. <laughs> and uh, the foreshore, yeah. uh, he grazed all it. He was really, a, he, you know, he herded them. But it just shows how the pace was nice and slow in those days. Yeah. And then, of course, there were the fishermen in Port Logan, but really when we came here, the regulars had dwindled. I, I have a feeling the war would finish it. Uh, because there was only the few, like the John Huttons of this world and Robert Heaney, um, and the black the black holes were, the still, black holes were yeah. still doing yeah. a big lot. He was a full time fisherman, whereas the rest were part time, mm -hmm. and he was obviously after crab and oysters. Mm. But the thing was, in those days, they weren't fussy about crabs. Whereas no, today, but they did not. It wasn't fashionable to eat no, crab in no. those days. No. They were chucked back. Mm -hmm. They were a nuisance. So it, it shows how the changes have, have occurred. Meeting habits. Have yeah, meeting yeah. habits, yeah. yeah. In the village, of course, in all the villages, there were many more shops. I mean, if you take Dromore, you had um, shops there, you had tailors, you had the bakeries, you had uh, a choice of grocers, and you had an ironmonger. Well, the big shop, Magal, had a fantastic range. He had the groceries, but he had a tremendous range of ironmongery and catered for farms, for fencing requirements, nails for building, and, and nearly everything, everything was there in Dromore. And to a lesser degree in Port Logan, they even had a dressmaker in Port Logan at one stage. And I think they had two shops anyhow that I remember, mm -hmm. you know. So the thing has really run down as far as that goes, a tremendous lot. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the blacksmith, there was a blacksmith, <coughs> wasn't there in Port Logan? Ah oh, yes, I'd, I'd nearly <laughs> forgotten him. When you think <coughs> back, in this area of, of the range there were uh, four blacksmiths. There was old Geordie Brunton in Port Logan in my day, I think the chap, a uh, Kosh, was before Geordie. Brunton, but when we were here, Geordie ruled, ruled supreme in the bottom row, and he did all the, the shoeing of the horses, that was his main priority, and then he did, you know, the hoops for the horse carts to a lesser degree, because they were being phased out when we were here, they were going on to rubber tyres, but he did harrows, and you see the harrow was a drag harrow which broke down the soil in the furrow prior to seeding grain or getting the ground ready to be grubbed for turnip sowing. And Geordie would spend most of the winter repairing these harrows because the land in this area is pretty stony. I don't mean some bits are rocky, but there's an awful lot of stone. And then the soil tends to be sandy and abrasive, terribly abrasive. So the poor old Harris only lasted two or three years and then it would be taken to the lights of Geordie and dismantled and all the points unscrewed 
and they were either uh, pointed afresh or extended or if they were too far gone he would chuck them out and put in new points. So Geordie had an ongoing job and then when you think back a lot of the farm buildings and stores <coughs> there were simple hinges made in the smithy and then when sliding doors came in vogue lo and behold the blacksmith made the rails made the simple mm -hmm. rail for the wheels to run on uh, and the Coburn track was a factory refinement really from the city and that to a degree took over from the blacksmith unfortunately mm -hmm. but now we're going and you said there was other smiddies in the area John I well, f from memory, we had the smithy obviously in Dromore today. It's still there where Davy Patterson holds forth. And then, if you move across to the Curragh Tree, uh, there was a smithy there, and that's very well looked after by Tommy Haney. But obviously, it's turned into a small farm today. But that was a smithy in the Glen. And then there was the smithy on the Mull Road, where the fork is to the Mull Farm and it forks to the right to go along uh, where the school is today. Mm -hmm. That was a smithy. And then there was another one at Clachan Moor, and it would be worked up until probably 20, 25 years ago by an uncle of Davy Patterson at Moor. So we had a fair representation of smiddies, but then, as you're aware, there was a big, big working population of horses and they all had four feet <laughs> and they all needed looking after on a very regular basis because the work uh, was sore on metal and, and on legs and on feet, and feet in particular. So it was an ongoing job, uh, shoeing and trimming and, and caring for the horses and plus the fact that the carts were locally made and it was a combination of skills from the local joiners and there were a lot of local joiners maybe twice or thrice what there are today <coughs> and they made the carts and obviously the blacksmith supplied the wheel uh, bands they did the accoutrements for tipping the carts and any metal parts associated with harnessing the horse to the shafts and so on. So it was a combined effort for that alone. And then ploughs, you see. There were one or two plough rights in the area, um, but I say one or two, literally only one or two, because it was quite a skilled job to make a plough, a steel plough that is, and the local blacksmiths often repaired or put in replacement parts and of course they always had to do the wearing points because they were continually being worn with abrasive soil as I said earlier. The soil in the whole of the rings is most abrasive unlike a clay soil. So they had a lot of regular work uh, from farms in addition to doing the necessary for the trains and the private houses and so on. Even uh, the work for wells was done by the blacksmiths often, you know, for water, mm -hmm. repairing the pipes, uh, etc. Along in conjunction with plumbers, of course. And you, you were mentioning earlier about um, not, not just the shops, but the travelling facilities that came to the farms. Aye, that, that was an interesting thing too, Janice, because <clears throat> I know person here at Columbia Mother did not travel out a lot to shop, and she was quite happy to be served like everybody else in the locality with travelling shops. We had grocers who came around loaded with everything you could mention, and then we had the specialist guys such as the bakers who came once or twice a week and we had a fishman. Did they come from Stranaro or Drumore? Well, for instance, we had a baker in Drumore, so he came around the southern part of the Rins from Drumore with fresh 
uh, produce on a very regular basis. I think it was twice a week he came here. Um, and we had the butcher in Dromoor. And then we had uh, grocers. We had two of them with travelling vans out of Dromoor that I recollect, and one from Stonycart, Mackenzie. He still had got a shop. And they were very well provisioned vans and vied with each other to get trade. Mm -hmm. And they came as regular as clockwork. We at one time had two chip vans, believe it or not, and that isn't so many moons ago. And they vied violently with each other and then both of them disappeared because I think there wasn't enough trade. It was ironic, mm -hmm. wasn't it? The other thing that might have been of interest was the fact that we had a local haulier who provided a carrier service, believe it or not. And each day Ronald Crawford from Port Logan had this little lorry and he would provide a daily service to take things into Stenraar. He would take it to the bus station or take it to the railway station because the railway station in those days was a valuable source of communication. Uh, there were not obviously the lorries, and certainly no, not the long distance lorries. And when you consider the maximum speed of a heavy lorry was 20 miles an hour, and the lighter lorries, they were allowed to do 30, you realise the advantage the train had, because mm -hmm. it wasn't tied down to that speed, and therefore it could bring... Was that a legal requirement, 20? Very. 30? Was it? It was indeed. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, it's unbelievable, but that's true. And those were not articulated lorries. No. Those were the lorries that had what we termed six wheelers. In other words, that a twin rear axle and could probably carry up to 12 tons. And the ordinary lorry would be doing well if it did six tons. You know, mm -hmm. that shows you how things have increased. In fact, a lot of the local lorries are only doing three or four tons, to be honest. But Ronald Crawford stayed in Port Logan and he did this as a, a steady trade. And Ronald never exceeded 20 even in his little lorry. But he was so reliable and dependable that it was a great asset to the community. And where did he keep his lorry? He had a little shed at the end of the bottom row from memory. And it often was a Bedford lorry he had. Um, I think there is the remains of a building there yet. Yeah, there is a bit left of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be his brother or connections, the same Crawford had the shop in Dromore, which Aidy has today. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about the Waybridge at Port Logan? No, I'm afraid I don't really. Mm -hmm. and, the, and The Waybridge was there when we came, but off memory, I can't remember it being used much. Yeah. Whereas the one in Dromore, I remember it being used. Yeah. And we used to get, you know, run down and get special uh, reason it would be weighed at Dromore. And where is it? Well, in those days it was down near the middle. Mm -hmm. But it's long since gone as well. And nowadays, as you know, Stenraar or Colmore is the nearest. Mm -hmm. And the well lorries run out of Dromore? Aye, <coughs> in, in the old days, well, there was Scott, who's still there, he's the only remaining child. But there was Scott, <coughs> there was McHaffey, and he had two or three lorries, and there was MacDonald, they only had one. But these three firms all hauled milk, and that was their stable support. Because <coughs> after the demise of the local creameries um, into Stranraer, the milk had to be carted off all the farms to Stranraer, and that meant that there was a tremendous haulage, especially in the summer months when there was a tremendous milk to haul, and it was all done in churns, or as we locals called them, cans. And they varied from 10 gallons, 12, 15, and up to 20. Most of them worked in 12s and 15s. The big 20s were ugly brutes and needed a hoist. So I was going they, to say, how did you get them on the lorry? Yeah, they, they needed hoist and they really were only used to send milk to Glasgow mm -hmm. because at one stage in the 30s a lot of milk was sent fresh to the city on rail but they had to be taken in biggest churns. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the local for handiness there were 10s and 12s up to 15 occasionally. 
and they, they were taken by lorries. Some farmers actually hauled their own with a cart or a tractor or even a car. Quite a lot of farmers have big car trailers. And the board, the milk board that is in those days, paid very well if you hauled your own milk. I, I, I can't recollect what it was per gallon, but I remember father said it was the best spent hour in the morning was hauling the milk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it just highlights how things have changed. And there was tremendous acrimony <coughs> when the board decided that they would put in bulk milk tanks, or farmers rather had to put in bulk milk tanks, and then there was a fight between the hauliers as to who was to get the bulk milk tank, because obviously they, w they were not going to need anything like the same number of bulk uh, tankers, which you know could hold two or three thousand gallons, mm -hmm. compared to a flat lorry with a few with a, a fair number of churns, but obviously not taking anything like that quantity, and there was a lot of ill feeling because there was a cut back in lorry numbers. And in many cases, especially in the more the lorry, the lorry traders that did not get the bulk lorry folded up. Mm -hmm. There was not enough local trade. You see, in those days, they carted milk in the morning, threw the cans off in a yard, it's still raw, and then hauled feeding stuff from the grain merchants, instant raw, out to the farms during the rest of the day, picked their cans up about four or five in the afternoon and went home with them. They Ready were washed, the they were washed, time. you see, generally at the creamery, and delivered them in the morning and got the full ones on, which meant the farmer had to have two lots of churns. Mm -hmm. That was the way it worked. Mm -hmm. But then it fitted in in those days because in Stranraer there were three main grain merchants, 